Let me get one thing clear straight away. For me, the label science fiction is primarily a bookseller's convenience. It tells the guy who runs the store on which particular shelf he should put this particular book. I'm not a science fiction writer, quotes on and off. I'm a writer, punct. I've done practically everything that one can do in the writing field, short of technical manuals and advertising copy. And I suppose if you count jacket blurbs as ad copy, I've even done that. Let me, in fact, read you a science fiction poem to illustrate this point that there's no discontinuity in my own mind between the different things that I do. It's called What We Have Here, because I found scrawled up in the hallway of a slum apartment building in New York in 1968, what we have here is a failure to communicate. When those creatures who had men for ancestors set off in the ember glow of the dying galaxy in search of fellow mourners for its funeral, they came very shortly to Arcturus and there found bones in heaps around machines which had been listening to the sky a million years and likewise found at Regulus and Rigel and Deneb and Polaris and Denebola and Canopus and Capella and Akernar and 60 systems in the Magellanic clouds, bones, piled up bones, and electronic ears listening and listening while no one spoke. Now some people find it strange that a science fiction writer should also be a poet of some small standing, but to me it is not in the least puzzling because for example, I admire above all contemporary British writers Anthony Burgess, whose most outstanding quality is his versatility. It is not that he can be relied on every time to produce a unique masterpiece. It's far more that everything he does, from his historical novel about Shakespeare to his fine one-volume guide to Joyce's work, in everything he does, he displays an unfailing level of competence and craftsmanship. And when it comes to what Dale Mullen has so graphically called the science fiction ghetto, one has to recognize that it's of relatively recent creation. People who read Anthony Burgess's work take it for granted that since he's a talented novelist living in a world that's been changed out of recognition by the impact of science and technology, he should now and then hit on a science fiction theme, as he did in, for example, A Clockwork Orange. And this, I think, is the way it ought to be. In earlier times, I don't honestly believe there was any discontinuity between the audience that Doyle's books reached, whether he was writing the Sherlock Holmes canon or his historical novels. I honestly don't believe that The Lost World, which is an out-and-out -out science fiction novel, startled or displeased his readers. Granted, there may have been some difference in the audience between H.G. Wells's socially conscious novels of the present day and his scientific romances, but I'm certain equally there was a very considerable overlap. It seems sensible from this to assume that there is always an audience for fantastic and marvelous tales, and in fact if one looks back at the historical record it makes far better sense to try and trace a continuity of an audience of this kind than it does to try and trace some kind of literary genealogy in which a writer of one generation specializing in or dabbling in marvel tales influenced directly a writer of the following generation. I would say, in short, that the voyages of Sir John Mandeville, which were the equivalent of a bestseller back in the Middle Ages, would be far closer to the linear tradition that gave rise to science fiction than would, for example, Bishop Godwin's book about Domingo Gonzalez's voyage to the moon. In each generation, there is a greater or lesser interest in fantastic and marvelous events. Some expansive cultures are excited about strange far-off places and future times. Others, perhaps more introverted, perhaps more frightened, tend to shy away from the strange. But 
the continuity of the audience for fantastic literature has come down through the ages, right the way back to Lucian of Samosata, and on through, oh, one might mention Gulliver's Travels, one might mention Ryder Haggard's She. Essentially, the impulse seems to be the same, although the nature in which it is manifest varies according to the culture. It is, I think, absolutely no coincidence that regular readers of science fiction also enjoy historical novels such as Mary Renault's novels about Theseus, The Bull from the Sea. I think it is also no coincidence that the only definitive biographical novel about Roger Bacon, Dr. Mirabilis, has been written by a man who got his grounding in science fiction, by James Blish. I myself have a tremendous interest in periods of history which I was not taught much about at school because they were out of fashion and didn't seem to relate directly to our present day culture. But the inclination towards science fiction tends to imply also an inclination towards the fantastic, the marvelous, the extraordinary. And the barriers between science fiction, so-called, and the mainstream, not only of literature, but of entertainment in general, are being very steadily eroded, thanks particularly, I would say, to the use of what we would formerly have called science fiction imagery in television series like The Avengers, or in movies like The Bond Thrillers. What would, a few years ago, have been dismissed as hopelessly fantastic is done so realistically that one is convinced these gadgets could exist in present time. Still more important in the erosion of the barriers between science fiction and the rest of fiction is a rapprochement of styles, which is, and has been for some years, very conspicuous. On the one hand, one might cite people from outside the field, like Kurt Vonnegut and Anthony Burgess, who have used science fiction themes. Equally, on the other side, one might cite people inside science fiction who have used techniques drawn from elsewhere. Jimmy Ballard in England, for example, has drawn quite heavily on stylistic effects, some of which can be traced back to Jorge Luis Borges, and many of which are reflected in contemporary poetry. Brian Aldiss has made a deliberate adaptation of Joyce's most extreme styles in a book of his called Barefoot in the Head. And for me, this is an excellent thing. While it is true that the standard chronological narrative form has served writers whose shoestrings I am not worthy to unlatch, it is equally true that the matter and the manner must be matched in whatever kind of writing. For many years, science fiction has been stylistically rather conservative. In the hands of Wells, who was not writing category SF, it was not. I think it is an extremely healthy trend that the stylistic techniques evolved in the so-called mainstream are now being applied to science fiction, just as I feel it is very healthy that writers in the mainstream are falling upon science fiction themes and instead of treating them with the disdain, which was typical perhaps as recently as 20 years ago, uh, according them as much intensity, as much application, and as much imagination as the more contemporary subjects, the more conventional subjects, I would say, to which they have also applied their craft.